Hello, Internet. This is Garrig, and this is the causes of and solutions to climate change on a single slide. Basics and introductions. So this is the first of what I'm hoping will be a series of videos that I plan to make on the topic of climate change solutions. This one in particular is meant to address a, a sort of family of responses that I've seen people have to the climate crisis, some of which say it's not happening or it's not humans or whatever, you know, the answer of which always comes to do nothing. This is, of course, patently false, though we're not going to get into the details about that here. The other is it's too late. It's impossible to solve this issue. Also not true. We have the solutions. Then you have people who often make the argument that it's overly complicated, that uh, wrapping your head around it's nearly impossible, that addressing this is so complicated that there's no way to do it, also not true. And then you have another group that does sort of the opposite weirdly, where there's these like dogmatic oversimplified responses, like if only we were to cast off capitalism and embrace communism, or if everyone were to become vegan, or if we embrace degrowth, things that are frankly just not going to happen in the time that we have to address this, and frankly also scare away the normies, um, and are unnecessary. We can solve this with various technologies, techniques, and approaches, and I'm going to be going through those. Uh, since this is a basics video, let's touch on the basics. It's happening, it's us, it's serious, it's solvable, backslash there's hope. Uh, feel free to read this or take a look at some of the links in the description, which will also be uh, discussing some of the stuff that we're going to talk about in the rest of the video. Let's keep going. Also worth noting is that the medical community has called the global warming phenomena the greatest threat to global public health that there is. Um, so there's that. Again, take a look at my video from last week for more on that, or just read this. Cool. All right, so let's talk about the emission sources themselves, and all of these numbers are approximate. They're approximate because these numbers change every year. Sometimes they even change seasonally or by every month. They change based on how you measure them or what you consider what category or how you break up the categories. But the important thing is these are approximate numbers, but they are true. And they're important for the discussion of what we're going to be going on about. So let's take a look at them. So number one, electricity generation is responsible for about 25% of all emissions. Transportation is responsible for less than to about 20% of emissions, while in the U.S. it's closer to about 30%. Non-electrical temperature control is responsible for less than to about 10%, materials manufacturing under 25 but more than 20%, agriculture and land use about to under 25%, and when you look at all these, 75% of all of the warming is caused by carbon dioxide, about 6% is caused by nitrous oxide compounds, most of which are associated with these other emitters, about 1% from fluorinated gases, we'll talk about that when we get to it, and about 18%, that is to say nearly 20%, is caused by methane. The reason why methane is going to be highlighted like that is because it's important to realize that methane emissions break down in the atmosphere with a half-life of between 6 to 12 years, depending on specifics, and so in a decade or a few decades, most of the warming from methane self-resolves. That's something most people don't know, that if we stopped all of our emissions right now, in about 20 years or so, about a fifth of the observed warming just disappears. So, important to know. Let's continue. All right, so, the single biggest subchunk, as I call them, is coal, which is responsible for about 20% of all emissions and is about 36% of all global electricity at this time, though that number is decreasing pretty rapidly. About 5% of all emissions come from fossil gas, aka natural gas, which provides about 22% of all global electricity at this time. About under 1% of all emissions comes from everything else. Most of that comes from petroleum being burned for electricity, which is actually under to about 3% of global electricity. It's, it's not hugely common. Now, I also have fugitive emissions here. That's to say, just leaking methane, essentially. About 2% of all global warming comes from methane leaking from coal mines, while about 4% of all emissions is methane that leaks out of the oil and gas industry. This is stuff, this, these are emissions that literally do nothing. They have done no good for anybody. They're literally just leaking into the air, warming the earth. 
it sucks, but they can be addressed. All right, so you can see that about 60% of all electricity right now comes from fossil fuels, while about 40% comes from carbon clean energy. So we're already about 40% of the way there. Good for us. And this is increasing rapidly, but needs to increase faster. So let's talk about the details. So currently approaching 5%, is solar power, which we're hoping to get to between 15 to 35%, while wind is currently approaching 8%, which we're also hoping to get to between 15 and 35%. And that's sometime between 2040 and 2060 is what we're thinking. But the earlier the better. If we can get there in the 2030s, great. Now, they're yellow because the stuff I have in yellow is the stuff that is currently cheaper than the fossil fuel option and also typically a better product. So better product at a lower price. Solar power in terms of PV is currently the cheapest way to generate electricity that human beings have ever had. It's also the fastest to set up. Wind is the second cheapest and also the second fastest to set up, and they reinforce each other beautifully. It's typically sunnier when it's less windy, and it's typically windier when it's less sunny in most parts of the world. So great stuff. Let's keep going. Hydropower is currently at about 15% of electricity, and in the future, we're thinking that's going to be somewhere between 10 and 25% as the grid expands. Um, I also can include tidal as sort of a wild card in the hydro category. Next up, we've got nuclear, which is currently at about 9% of electricity, which will probably be somewhere between 5 to 25% in the future, depending on all sorts of stuff, including the wild cards of how small modular reactors will end up coming into play, as well as thorium reactors. Again, wild cards. As of right now, conventional nuclear power is very slow to build out and very expensive to build out. That hasn't always been true, but it's typically true in most of the world now. All right, now geothermal is, in my opinion, grossly underutilized. We're only tapping about 10%, uh, less than 10%, actually, of the sort of low-hanging, old-fashioned geothermal fruit um, for about half a percent of global electricity demand, which could be up to 5% or around 5% if we were getting more of it. Now, we also have enhanced geothermal systems, which vastly expand the sort of places that we can do geothermal in so we could get over well over 10 percent of our electricity from geothermal using those technologies and then there's also emerging technologies called advanced geothermal which expand it even further with the goal of expanding it to everywhere potentially again wild cards so really wide range in this one now last up we have bioenergy at currently about two and a half percent of global electricity which in the future could be somewhere between one and ten percent of electricity. Now bioenergy is uh, controversial. You don't want to, if you're going to be cutting down trees to be throwing into a power plant and these trees wouldn't have been cut down for other reasons, that's not carbon negative, that's not carbon neutral, um, that is uh, yeah, that's bad. <laughs> so most of the bioenergy is going to be based on waste, right? Agricultural waste, uh, residential waste, uh, you know, paper waste, lumber waste, but also uh, sewage and like potentially human waste. There's a technology called hydrothermal carbonization that essentially pressure cooks organic material and turns it into carbon neutral charcoal and produces sort of a waste fluid that you can use to generate biogas. That's carbon neutral methane. Um, there's also biofuels, but those are not a great way to generate electricity, though they do have their uses and we'll discuss those as we get there. So you're going to want to be doing this on modern interconnected grids that are able to take electricity from where it's being generated to where it needs to go, including across countries and potentially across continents. Um, there's uh, some technologies involved in that called direct current high voltage, um, you know, power lines. Yeah, that's going to be helpful for that. But a modern interconnected grid is also going to have a lot of energy storage in it. We're going to try to go through these rapid fire. Batteries are, you know, very fast and responsive, but, um, you know, and very efficient as well. But currently not actually all that big of a percentage of current stored energy. That's mostly pumped hydro, which is essentially a, a lake at the bottom of a hill and at the top of a hill. When you have extra energy, you pump it up the hill. When you need energy, you let it flow down the hill through a generator. Pretty straightforward. Gravity batteries are fairly similar, except you use a solid thing, typically um, a container full of soil or literally just a big block connected to essentially a crane. When you have electricity, you crank it up, and then when you need electricity, you switch over to a generator and you let it back down. 
pretty straightforward. Compressed air is exactly what it says in the tin. You use excess electricity to draw in air, compress it, and when you need electricity, you let it pass through a generator. You can also make that a little bit more dense by adding cold to that element. You can freeze the air or solidify the CO2 in the air and then use that as uh, your energy storage system. So there's also stored heat, which just stores the electricity as heat and then uses it to run a generator when you need it. And then you've got hydrogen. Hydrogen is not a very good way to store electricity. It's much less efficient, like 30-ish percent rather than the sort of 70s that most of these are at or 80s. Um, but hydrogen can be used for other things, which we're going to discuss as we get there. Also notable, once you've stored all the energy that you need and you're using all the energy that you need and you've made all the hydrogen that you need, you still might have some excess electricity in a grid that has so much solar and wind. And in that event, you shunt that energy to carbon capture and sequestration technology, which draws carbon dioxide out of the air and then sequesters it underground. Um, that's a very energy inefficient process, but if you have a grid like this, you will likely have times of the year and times of the months and stuff that you will be able to do this. Cool, let's move on. Transportation. So the biggest chunk here and one of the largest chunks overall is road traffic. That's your cars, your trucks and stuff. The answer here, well, look at the bottom there. You see increased public transportation, micromobility, as well as just a sort of general statement of increasing energy and material efficiency measures. But other than that, it's electric vehicles. Um, electric cars, trucks, motorcycles, work vehicles, buses, and road shipping. We could talk about this for a long time, but essentially what it boils down to is the electric vehicle is always the superior option in terms of emissions, and that's both carbon emissions and air pollution compared to fossil vehicles. Also, they are, um, their batteries can be used at the end of life as static energy storage, or you can use them during their life as distributed energy storage with bidirectional charging. Next up, we've got maritime. That's about 2.5% of all emissions come from boats, most of which is from shipping. Notably, nearly 40% of all shipping is literally just moving around fossil fuels. So you remove fossil fuels from the equation, a lot of those emissions disappear immediately. Now, how to address it is a little trickier. It's kind of harder to uh, decarbonize. What you do is you can use biofuels or what are called synthetic e-fuels. Synthetic e-fuels are where you take carbon dioxide out of the air, and then you take hydrogen um, from split water, by the way, using green energy, and you combine them and you sort of create these uh, artificial hydrocarbon fuels. Now, you can do that to make methanol with both of those techniques, both as a biofuel or as a synthetic e-fuel, and that works. Um, you can use other options as well, of course. But um, wind can be used to reduce fuel consumption, essentially giant kites, giant industrial kites put on boats. Um, and you can also make nuclear boats. Uh, this is, of course, a uh, very controversial option, but I kind of have to throw it out there. Worth noting is that there are electric boats, and you should use them when you can. Electricity directly used is always the most efficient option, um, but uh, it's limited in how big those boats can get at this point and how big their range is. We don't know what the limitations of electric technology is going to be, but uh, we do have several electric boat options at the smaller scale. There's also the possibility of using hydrogen as a direct fuel, but that has a lot of logistical issues. So next up, we're gonna talk about air travel. This is also about two and a half percent of global warming emissions. This is also gonna be likely solved by a mixture of biofuels and synthetic e-fuels gradually phased in over time, typically as a mixture in the beginning and then as it becomes more economically viable, becomes dominant until it's the whole thing. Now, there's also discussion of future fueling with hydrogen, but that is kind of a logistical nightmare. And then there's also the possibility of electric, but again, you know, what is the limitation? We don't know yet. At this point, there are smaller electric planes that travel shorter distances and they're getting bigger and farther all the time, but how far, how big, we don't know. So as of right now, we're looking at biofuels and synthetic e-fuels. Okay, rail, less than 1% of emissions come from rail. Fully electrify those trains, expand the rail system, use it more. It's extremely efficient. Cool. Space gets a short shout out. It's a tiny contributor to emissions and also you can green it with uh, green liquid hydrogen and oxygen. 
possibly synthetic fuels, including possibly uh, biogas if you need to, but uh, not a big contributor, so let's just move on. Okay, next up is temperature control. These ones are hard to disentangle, so I didn't. So you've got your space heating, your water heating, your dryers, and your cooking. Essentially, electrify them all. For space heating, use heat pumps and improve your insulation. For water, use electric water heaters. For dryers, uh, electrify your, ga your gas-based dryers for those that still have those. It's a minority, but they still exist. And then uh, for cooking, use more induction cooking. It's a superior cooking form at a lower cost overall. And uh, direct, direct electric is cheaper, but not necessarily a better product, but it is a good option for a lot of folks. And then um, for when you absolutely need a flame, you can use biomass or biogas-based fuels. The last percent here is air conditioning and refrigerators leaking, their fluorinated gases. Um, improve the efficiency, the design standards, and disposal to minimize leakages, and then destroy the HFC chemicals and use lower greenhouse gas alternatives. Pretty straightforward. All right. Next up, about 8% of all global warming comes from cement. Uh, you can substitute the fossil fuels used in this process by using hydrogen or direct electric as a heat source. That gets rid of 5% of global warming right there. And then you can use direct source carbon capture to get the remaining 3%. It's also worth noting that there are low to carbon negative alternatives to cement, like hempcrete and mushroomcrete. And there are actually ways to inject carbon dioxide into cement as it cures for like bricks and stuff. Not useful for every situation, but we should use it as much as we can. For steel, which is about also seven to eight percent of all emissions, um, we can use hydrogen direct iron reduction to turn the iron ore into iron, and then we can use biochar as the source of the carbon instead of coal, and potentially have carbon negative steel with that technology. Now, I also do have a bit of a shout out to molten oxide electrolysis technology here, which literally just uses electricity to go from ore to iron. This would be a yellow one once it becomes more widespread. Um, because it is cheaper and can actually use lower grades of ore as well. So that's cool. Watch that space. Plastics and plastic-associated petrochemicals are kind of a pain. They're about 4% of all emissions, and um, this is where that material efficiency measures comes in. Use less of them, recycle them better, because as of right now, like less than 10% of them actually get recycled. But we do have a carbon-negative option, and that's bioplastics, where we use algae, fungus, or cellulose as the source of the carbon. Now, um, aluminum is about 2%. Everything else is about three. That's your glass, your ceramics, and your metals, and everything else. Electrify where possible. Use hydrogen if needed. And then in the select situations where you need them, you've got your synthetic and your biogas options. Also, gotta say, using more carbon-negative building materials, like sustainably harvested and sealed woods, um, using those aforementioned like hempcrete and so forth, and also just more green spaces in general are going to be useful for carbon negative effects. So for agriculture and land use, this one is weird. They're kind of uh, ranges more so because it depends on how you count them. Number one is going to be 11% to 14.5% of all emissions comes from animal agriculture. Notably, 7 to 10% is from cattle alone. Most of this is from their methane emissions, which we can neutralize by adding Asparagopsis seaweed to their diets. This is all ruminants, cows, sheep, goats, and so forth. At about 2% of their dietary uh, intake, you're seeing a 99% reduction of their methane emissions. Awesome stuff. We can also cover and collect uh, their methane emissions and use their waste as a bioenergy source. Again, see that HTC. But until then, it is probably best to reduce your beef intake. It can drop you from a 3.3, um, you know, uh, annual tons of CO2 emissions from your diet to a 1.9 or lower if you also reduce your cheese intake. All right, cool. So landfills are about 2, two to 4% of emissions. Wastewater is about one to two. And in this case, you can also cover and collect the methane emissions and use the biomass as sources of bioenergy using the aforementioned hydrothermal carbonization technology. All right, rice is a tricky one. It's between 1.3% of our emissions to 2.5%, and that, that's probably the only one that we can't really get to true zero, but we can reduce it. 
by using updated rice cultivation techniques and use strains that are lower in methane, and also just by diversifying people's diets. It's healthier for them, it's a better quality of life, and also, um, you know, better for the environment as I'm discussing. Okay, last up, we've got 2 to 10%. That's everything else. That's deforestation, habitat destruction, and all other agriculture. First of all, decarbonizing agriculture. So nitrogen fertilizers make up about 2% of all global emissions, and you can use hydrogen to make it instead of using fossil gas. Okay, now electrify everything else that you can in the associated uh, machinery and transport and where electrification doesn't work, you can use synthetic or biofuels. All right, deforestation, pretty straightforward. Stop deforestation and habitat destruction as we increase reforestation, soil rehabilitation, and habitat restoration on both land and sea. It's yellow because not only is this cheap, but Forests and habitats are more valuable to us as forests and habitats than they are as temporary farmland or as lumber. Um, essentially, you get tourism income, you get recreational use, you get your hunting, your fishing, your boating, but you also have research, you have um, many ecological uh, services, which includes carbon sequestration and a bunch of other things involved. Now, I do want to give a quick shout out to lower carbon diets. I'm not saying everybody needs to be vegetarian or vegan, but for those who want to, it should be as easy as possible. And for everybody else, it's worth incorporating more carbon negative foods, potentially carbon negative foods into your diet. Once you decarbonize agriculture, foods like bivalves, uh, that's your mussels and clams, scallops and oysters, they actually sequester carbon in their calcium carbonate shells. Growing seaweed is also carbon negative, potentially, and then tree foods, because you have to, you know, grow trees in order to, uh, to produce them. This is not just your nuts and your fruits and your tree-grown vegetables, but it also includes tree-grown carbohydrates like acorns and breadfruit. Okay, last up, agrivoltaics and hydro solar. Uh, basically, you can kind of double use land by putting solar panels over crops um, that require you know, partial shade, and you can put solar panels on water to reduce evaporation at reservoirs and dams, as well as like uh, irrigation locations and stuff. Also, final shout outs to regenerative farming, carbon sequestration farming, and also recognizing that offshore wind increases local bioproductivity as things start to grow on them and then attract other things. Now, you'll notice here that the big theme is energy, right? And it's important to recognize that this idea that energy is scarce is an artificially maintained illusion of the fossil fuel industry. On Earth, energy is abundant. It's just a matter of building out the collectors, the containers, and the distributors of that energy. And once we do that, we build a world that isn't just cleaner and healthier and more sustainable, though it is, but it's also less expensive, it's more stable, it's more comfortable, and it's more prosperous. And not just for the developed world. It is cheaper and easier and faster to develop in this fashion than it is with fossil fuels. If you don't have to build gas lines, you just saved a whole bunch of time and money. If you don't have to build petrol stations, you just saved a whole bunch of time and money, not to mention reduced fire risk and health issues with air pollution as well. So the point is, is that we have all of the solutions that we need to solve this problem. We just have to implement them boldly, swiftly, and consistently. Thank you very much for your time, and I hope to talk to you again soon.